From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Armchair Experts with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network. And now, here is Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. All right, off and running, another edition of Armchair Experts, Leon and Massaro, back again, like it or not. Uh, Richard, well, first of all, I think we need to get some business out of the way. It's uh, a little bit late, but happy birthday, a belated birth, happy birthday wish to our pal John DeVita, spinning the dials. Yes, happy birthday, Jad. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Seventy. I had a great, great birthday this year. What'd you do? Anything special? Well, my sister had a surprise party for me up in Wisconsin this Saturday before. She had a bunch of guys from the 511 Club and some of our neighbors up there. Um, and I was really surprised. I didn't realize that she was going to have a big birthday party for me. So that was a great day, lad, the Saturday before. And then on my birthday, uh, I spent my day with my greatest pal, Kevin and his mother and dad, they had me over to their house for dinner. Well, that's nice. That's so a, that's it, 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 was, it was a very, very nice birthday. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, you're yeah. a great guy, John. Well, so, thank you. Uh, we hope you have uh, many more and, uh, you know, that you keep staying productive for a, li- a well, long time. Yeah. I, I hope the good Lord keeps me, uh, keeps me moving. We yeah. had some uh, birthdays celebrations over the weekend for us. Uh, Dana's mom, Betty, turned 89 Whoa. on Saturday. Friday, we went to um, uh, Ravinia. The, uh, um, it was an interesting program at Ravinia. The CSO was, um, they were showing the movie West Side Story on the screen in the pavilion and out on the lawn. And they were, um, uh, the CSO was playing the score and accompanying the movie. So that was kind of a cool event. You guys are so cultural. Yeah, we, we got, all we, I, we all got, I do is we got, sit around at the library and talk to Jimmy Sunshine and Jimmy uh, we got Sports cult- Jimmy. We got culture, I'm telling you. You got culture. You got culture. And I, I have to tell you, too, I, it's always nice to be able to acknowledge some uh, Ridgewood names. Um, but um, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Dana had uh, a project she was doing, a uh, work project that she was, a uh, marketing project that she was doing over at Sears. And... Um, I decided, eh, I think we need to make something nice. So I went and uh, went, and I said I was going to cook. And um, I went over. I went over by the Jewels in Woodridge to mm-hmm. pick up some stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I decided, to, you know, I picked up some stuff. I found some, some couple, you know, nice couple of steaks going to make outside. Going to grill some vegetables. And I decided, eh, I think we need a, I think we need a beverage. So I decided I was going to uh, get us some uh, margaritas, bottle b- bottle of pre-made margaritas. I was carded. Yeah. Well. Okay. Sixty sixty two years old, and they carded me. I, I have no comment on that, Jim. Yeah, sixty two years old, and they carded me. So I had some acknowledgments from. Uh, some of our Ridgewood fans, as I, or friends, as we put it, as I put it up on the um, on Facebook, acknowledging that Bill Caravia says it's all good. You're young again. Mm. Ron Barkley uh, liked the comment. Chris Lesh liked the comment. It's always nice to hear uh, from old Ridgewood people. By the way, just speaking of old old old, old classmates, yeah, I did locate Ron Pezzapane. Oh, good. I, well, I can tell you. I'm you're happy thrilled. with that. Too. I can tell you're thrilled. I'm I'm ecstatic. I can tell you're thrilled. So what do you want to talk about, Masaro? Since I, I can't get you excited about anything today. We were, we, you know, we last yesterday when I saw you in the library. We were. Yeah, we, we had what we laughingly, about, uh, what we uh, laughingly call a show prep, and I have no, no, no memory of what we talked about. Uh, and you know, we texted back and forth extensively last night, and uh, I think we left the show right on the, uh, on the, on the our phones. <laughs> Yeah, what, what did we talk about? <laughs> because you know what, what the funny thing, Jim, is think about this. We, we we talk about these things, and I think we both. I, I we had never talked about this between us, but I think we have a problem. Say, okay, everything that we texted back and forth uh, about last night, 
we I think we both have a hang up about well you know what we can't talk about that on the show because uh, today because it's not going to be fresh or, or or we already no, talked about no. that so it's it's an interesting uh, problem but the thing that we did talk about in the library yesterday and Jim uh, or John one of you two guys be, uh, because when you, uh, I saw James Garner's obit in the in the uh, paper yesterday and last week there was somebody. Uh, you know, not similar to James Garner, but another uh, big name from our era that passed. And I read the obit, and I can't think of who the heck it was. Are you thinking of Lane Stritch? It wasn't Elaine Stritch. Uh, and, and it was an that, interesting uh, character, too, by the way. In fact, I think it, uh, the obit I'm thinking of was probably the same day as Elaine Stritch's was in there. And it was somebody from our era that, uh, and I'm uh, when I saw James Garner's uh, uh, obit, I'm like, oh, wow. You know, th- now a lot of people... I remember going over to my grandfather's house on a Sunday night, and we'd you know we'd watch Maverick with James Garner and uh, what was Jack? Uh, who was that? Jack who? Jack Kelly. Jack Kelly. And, and then, do you remember uh, the later, third one? Later, Roger Moore. Came Roger in Moore. As, uh, Bo, the uh, yeah. cousin of right. the of the Maverick brothers. Right. But James, you know, James Garner was just an easy guy, <clears throat> uh, even though you know it was on the screen. Uh, obviously, I never met him. Uh, just an easy guy to like. His persona was just an easy one to take. It 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 was kind of it was kind of interesting too. I saw an article uh, last night on uh, that was posted as a link to Yahoo. He you can almost credit finding a parking space to his career in the theater. Uh, a f- a friend of his. Uh, when he went out to California, he was doing a variety of jobs from. You know, re- you know, restaurant bartender, mm-hmm. you know, swimsuit, you know, catalog model, whatever he could get out there. And a, a friend of his said that he was going to become a Hollywood agent. So Garner went off, served his time in the service in Korea, and came back and was driving down Hollywood Boulevard. And he saw a sign with this guy's name. And uh, as he was driving by, he saw suddenly a, par- a car pulled out, and there was a parking space. So he decided, "Oh, I'm going to stop in and say hello to him and see." Now that he's achieved his dream, see how he is. The guy's name, I believe, was Paul Gregory. And he found out when he went in to say to talk to him, he found out that Gregory was producing a play. And he immediately off, and there were a number of roles in there uh, that it was uh, non-speaking roles. And he immediately hired Garner for one of those roles. Hmm. The play was the Kane Mutiny, or oh, the Kane the Kane yeah. Mutiny trial. Okay. And he had an opportunity there. He said it was a great way to work and study, because he didn't have anything to say, and he had to keep himself awake because he was one of the jurors in the jury box, in the in the in the play, and he had himself an opportunity to watch. Lloyd Nolan and Henry Fonda mm. at work. And he also wound up going to Broadway with that play. Uh, the, the play initially was premiering in Santa Barbara, California, and he went, went to Broadway. The play appeared, uh, the, the play ran for over 400 performances on Broadway. So he had an opportunity to just watch Henry Fonda, and a lot of people, and he, he says, Garner said, I stole everything from Henry Fonda. That's interesting because I, as you're saying all this, uh, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way towards James Garner, but I wouldn't think. Uh, I mean, he yeah. was a, a personality that you like to see on the screen. He was always a guy. I don't ever. I don't think James Garner ever played any kind of a heavy a- ever. And I, I was thinking as you're talking, Jim, you, you get a guy like say uh, a Fonda, and maybe Fonda is not the the best uh, example, but say Marlon Brando, for instance, went through. The, was it the Stanislav? Uh, who was yeah, it? Yeah, uh, he was an, He went to Actor Studio. Actor Studio. Right. A lot of and and there are other big names that don't come to mind right now that that did study their art, and I'm wondering uh, now, as you say, Garner studied Henry Fonda because he got this role in the Kane Mo- uh, Mutiny trial, but did. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know that James Garner. It, it was like uh, a comfortable old shoe. The, the acting business in him. He just he, he was he was a guy, not as big a star as a John Wayne. But when you saw John Wayne on on screen, 
no matter what role he played, it was always John Wayne. You know, not you know he could have been playing Rooster Cogburn or he could have been playing uh, you know the 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 Quiet Man, but it was always John Wayne. And I think James Garner, uh, on a, a lower level, in my opinion, he was always just James Garner. You know, uh, and there's other actors you could say that about Marlon Brando. What do you saw him on screen? He was playing a different personality every time. He was the Godfather. He was Terry Malloy. He was the guy in the Wild One. Uh, so he, he was, was in, playing what a was different. It Sayonara too. He was playing a different persona almost every time. Whereas other actors, when you see them, they are them every time. You know, it, it's it, they may be playing a different role. But it's always you're, you're looking at James Garner as opposed to Don Corleone, you know, uh, and it's that's an inter- I, I find that to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering if Garner ever act- actually took an acting uh, that, lesson. That I haven't found out from reading. Yeah, um, he did. Um, um, he did write a book uh, a few years ago, and it might be worth looking at since mm-hmm. you're all over in the library. Oh yeah. See I'm you, wondering if his book is out. Uh, yeah. I, th- I think it was uh, uh, published in 08. Hmm. So you might... Uh, I, I tell you, I, the one movie that I remember him being in, uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but it, it wasn't so much what Garner did in the movie, because Garner uh, did a lot of comedic type of things when he did Maverick. But the, the astounding part, uh, seeing that movie... Uh, at the time that it was put out, the movie being Support Your Local Sheriff, was I had never seen the actor Jack Elam be anything but uh, a heavy. And in that movie, he was funny. He was a, he was a James Garner's comedic sidekick, mm-hmm. and it was just interesting to see a guy like Jack Elam be uh, placed in a role like that. And, mm-hmm. and it really, enha- for me anyway, enhanced the movie to see a guy who... Again, was always the heavy. He had the bad eyes, so he, you know, that was a natural role that, for him. Always had that look. Yeah, and and you know, it was always interesting because I think he he Garner always surrounded himself with people that I think he was comfortable with. Mm-hmm. I, if I remember right, Elon probably did some uh, uh, some Rockford Files shows and Might some. Have, yeah, but I mean, he always had that. He, he always had um, um, Joe Santos. In the Rockford Files, who played the police uh, detective? Yeah, and uh, who was the guy that played Angel? Oh, geez, I don't know. Don't know. Stewart his name. something. I don't know his name. Stewart something, but good character actors. Noah Berry played his dad. Yeah, uh, and right. and and it was always people that I think he was comfortable with, and you, and it always came out. Well, let me with ask the you way this, they, Jim, with the way they played. When you bring up Noah Berry. Wasn't uh, now isn't is Noah Berry is was he Noah Berry Jr. or yeah. was he Noah, Noah Berry? Barry. Noah now Barry. wasn't Noah Berry uh, one of John Wayne's sidekicks? Uh, I believe movie? so. Yeah. I believe so. I I know he did some westerns and and uh, that that's what he was noted for. Okay, yeah, I'm very you know what one of those guys who uh, now if you hadn't said the name, obviously I can picture Noah Berry's face, and I could even picture him in some John Wayne odors. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to come up with that name unless I really, really had more time than I would have on this show to think about it. Then, then I probably would have had to look it up and we would have, and we got got it. We, One of us have got to start bringing a computer or I, something. You know what? I, was, I, I thought about uh, bringing my iPad, and then, you know, one of those things, you do something else before you walk out the door, and the next thing I knew... I'm in the car and I'm like, well, I'm not going back for it, <laughs> and uh, that's the you know. So, I, I yeah, uh, the iPad. Uh, I'm going to try to make that a part of uh, well of my routine for coming it, to the show. One of the things on my list of purchases sometime down the road here is going to be some sort of tablet. So you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we could settle iPad, arguments immediately. W- 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 the iPad would come in handy, John. One of the things we were talking about yesterday over coffee, and I think I'm surprised that the Chicago media, you know, because you're always looking for things to talk about, and I don't think it's controversial. I understand it, but the, I'm, I'm going to yeah. talk about the the White Sox here briefly, and I know you've got the paper turned to Bears news, but one of the things we talked about was that. Uh, last uh, over the winter, 
The Sox traded their closer, Addison Reed, to Arizona for a prospect, the third base prospect. Uh, Mike Davidson, is it? I yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, Mike Davidson is uh, in the minor leagues. He hasn't made the big big club. Uh, Connor Gillespie uh, is hitting 320-something. So I, I guess the, the thing I'm saying is the dots that could be connected is with Gillespie hitting as well as he, he has been, Gillespie hitting 322. Uh, that you probably really didn't need a third baseman at this point. I'm, I'm not saying this is, is a good argument or a right argument, but it's an argument that could be made. And now the Sox' big uh, Achilles heel this year so far has been the bullpen, and you gave up your closer. And uh, one of the things I'd be looking at uh, as far as an iPad is where uh, how Addison Reed how is Addison doing How Addison Reed year. is doing. Uh, that that's good. The only um, um, the only uh, uh, mention I've seen of him, and and actually I should have paid it, paid some attention to it uh, since the Cubs were uh, there over the weekend. Right. Uh, right. The only mention I uh, have seen in press of Addison Reed was uh, uh, after um, uh, Tony Gwynn passed away. Uh, Gwynn was his baseball coach, his college baseball coach. I, okay. And he said the first thing he did when, uh, first thing he did after Gwyn passed away was walk into uh, the clubhouse, walk over to his locker, take those seven cans of chaw, chewing tobacco out, and throw them away immediately. Yeah, that's a, you know what that is one of the nastier habits that a person can get into. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's strictly for I don't know how it tastes because I've never been a tobacco uh, person at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that there's a taste to it because why else would you you chew on it? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the expectorating part of it is a little yeah. nasty. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, listen. If you want to get a bet down uh, at the, at the uh, break, the uh, White Sox were 500 to one to win the World Series, and the Cubs were 2,000 to one. In case you want to get a. I, I have to ask you this. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, the Cubs don't have a snobball's chance in the H-E double hockey sticks. Uh, I mean, but the, the Sox, uh, you could actually make a case for them still to be a little bit in the running. So I, I well, thought, I what do you it, think? Could they I make the playoffs? It, no, I, I, I really, with the issues in the bullpen, I don't think so. And I think they're going to be a seller here pretty soon with the trade deadline coming up. Uh, within the next uh, couple of weeks, and, yeah, and it would not the, who's the likely it would, it would not surprise sold. me if you see Beckham moved. Actually, I don't even think it would surprise me if you saw Ramirez moved. I wouldn't be terribly shocked if I saw Ramirez moved. Well, I'm thinking that if they're thinking future and that they actually traded Addison Reed for a third baseman, regard and I know Davidson at one point early in the season was struggling with Gillespie hitting the way he's hitting and being uh, a pretty solid guy he may be a guy that could he be could traded. be he could be uh he could be very he, he could probably too. bring something decent for you yeah uh there i i heard a comment the other day on the radio and i'm inclined to agree with it too i really can't remember uh the last time that i felt positive about all four of the major teams mm -hmm. in town and the direction that they were going mm -hmm. or all five actually when you get right down to it Five, right? You know uh, the the baseball teams. Even though the Cubs have been two and eleven since the since the trade, with the with the uh, with the, the players in the minor leagues and the things that are happening, and you see somebody like Alcantara, who's come up and in nine games hitting two eighty six, not tearing up the league, but by golly, he's looking pretty good out there. Uh, and, and with people like. Uh, 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 the the kid they got from uh, uh, the athletics, Russell. Russell, mm -hmm. thank you. All of a sudden, I'm going blank on names lately. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Is it old age, John? J John, yeah, John. John's agreeing with me. Um, I I feel positive about the the direction the Cubs are going, even though it's been e even though it's been a difficult ride. Uh, everybody, you know, they've been very transparent through the whole thing. And they said, this is what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen. It's going to get much worse before it ever gets better. Mm -hmm. and, and it's starting to, and we may be starting to see it. 
The Sox, I think, are closer at this point in time than the Cubs, simply because there's some pieces there that might be serviceable, uh, and they can kind of do some of this stuff on the fly. As far as weaknesses on the Sox right now, well, Tyler Flowers is obviously not the answer behind the plate. Um, I, I got to figure he's going to get, you know, they, they're they're going to have to find a catcher somewhere along the way. Uh, as far as what they what they can move. I think Beckham is a Beckham is a possibility, and I think he's a little bit nervous about it. I think I saw something in here as I was flipping through it. Trades on the north side. Who do you think is going to go before the thirty first? My bet is uh, Darwin Barney. Maybe Nate sure holds too. Well, the, at this point, though, uh, you're you're just probably which I have no problem with. You're given you're probably giving Barney away because you're not going to get anything for him. You'll I mean, a, a great you'll glove, get a prospect. But I, I have to tell you, the way uh, Major League rosters are composed these days, a great glove man, unfortunately, is not a huge commodity. Uh, I was thinking yesterday, Jim, I'm glad you brought up Barney and, and Scherholtz, and, and it made me think about the makeup of a Major League roster. I would love to see them limit the number of pitchers on a Major League roster to 10, tops 11, because uh, I think there's a place for a guy, say, like a Darwin Barney in Major League Baseball, but because the rosters are composed of 12 and sometimes 13-man pitching staffs, which leaves you 12 position players, there are, there's no longer room on a Major League roster, I don't think. I mean, my way of thinking, anyway, for a great glove man. You, you already have... I, you, you yeah. Are, you already yeah. have the... Um, you you have to have a backup catcher, which normally is going to be a guy who defensively is solid, but may 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 or may not be most of the time may not be a really good stick. So you're already losing one potential pinch pinch hitter or good pinch hitter off the bench. Uh, so there's no room for a good glove man, and it it's just it's pathetic the way these rosters are made up these days. It, well, you know what I mean? In the case of a good glove man, a, a second baseman generally has never been known as a power position. There have been exceptions over the years. Uh, no, but you're, you're not talking about, you don't want a guy who's so, 190. Either. No, you don't want a Mario Mendoza. Um, the other possibility that I think, uh, and, and apparently there's been some interest in, there was a little interest in Junior Lake. Well, he's a guy that might be uh, traded because I'm thinking that uh, I saw that Baez is playing second base uh, at Iowa right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking by the end of the year, it's a possibility you would see Castro at short, Baez at second, and Alcantara in center. So yeah. Yeah. That that's a po I don't I don't think I actually like that, but I it would be interesting just to see them have a couple prospects up and playing regularly. So I, I think you're right. I think Barney will probably go to make room for that possible uh, thing to happen. And uh, Sheerholtz, I think, has, is more of a commodity than Barney. But and, uh, last and year last would have been year, the year to move him. Last this year, year was he's the, hitting about 203. And, and now buck 99. Not much, not much power. Buck, so. buck 99. Last year, this was one of those years, if you're trying to move him now, you're a year too late. But he is a commodity. I think the fact yeah. that he, uh, peep, uh, you know, there, there's an interesting thing, Jim. Whether the guy, now his batting average is not much this year, but I think he would be looked at as a guy who's a, uh, a good defensive player who actually potentially can swing the bat pretty well for you. I'm not saying spectacular, no. but, but, no, uh, he had a couple but of decent. He, he was a decent hitter. He's up to 230 this year. Okay. Right now. Uh, and if Mike Olt is the answer, please tell me what the question is. Well, I'd say this, though. I, I, I Louis Valbuena, there's another guy I would have gotten the uh, the iPad out on because I, I'm thinking Louis Valbuena has been with the Cubs for three or four years now. At least three. And I believe he might have come from the Indians. And uh, my feeling is they really, really like this guy. He must be a great guy in the clubhouse. Because uh, I would, I still would say, as long as you're going to finish last, I would have taken Mike Olt and and played him every day. But they don't, and I think that's actually a tip of the hat to Louis Valbuena, who they are playing, and uh, they must really like him. I, I would say Louis Valbuena is a guy. 
who, after his playing career is over, look for him to be employed by a major league organization oh, he'd be a good coach somewhere, somewhere yeah. along the way. Uh, Olt, I, I don't know what putting him out there every day w- would have done. Uh, reflected on the line of, on his stat line here right now, he's had uh, 26 hits in 183 at bats. That's a 142 batting average. He struck out 81 times in those 142 at or, uh, 183 at bats. 16 of his 26 hits have been extra bases. Well, can't knock that. I would say this, though. I mean, I, what I don't like, because I'll look at the box score every day that I see the paper, and I think if you're talking about a guy that's in Olt's position, uh, let's say he's a, you know, you're considering him a prospect, uh, you, you know, there's too many games where I see him getting one at-bat, one at-bat, one at-bat. And, uh, hey, if he's going to go bad, that's fine. But I, he needs to swing the bat or be a, up to the plate four times a game. Then maybe he needs to be in Iowa. Well, that, that's a that's a possibility. You know, maybe but, he uh, needs to be in Iowa. I, I don't see guy. them. I see. If I there's think, hope. I, I think there's a. Well, I'd say when you you got a guy who obviously can generate the power that he does, you always have to uh, keep him under consideration. You can't ignore that. You hope you have to hope for a guy like that to uh, to develop. But, uh, yeah, I don't see them, the, the way they're using him. I, I, the other thing is, everybody will say, you know, I'm nuts. But you I've put, uh, you put a guy a like that time. towards the middle of the order. You don't bat him eighth. Uh, you bat him in the middle of the order because he uh, – you got to give him the at-bats. you got to give him some opportunities. At the eighth, if, you're gonna, if you want a, a guy to uh, develop as a hitter, especially a young guy – yeah, you put a veteran eighth who knows how to handle being pitched around or not coming up with a lot of runners on base, maybe leading off a lot of innings. You don't put a uh, a young guy who's a power prospect in the eighth hole. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. So, disappointments this year. What's your uh, what's your view? Uh, disappointments on which Cubs uh, on the Cubs. I have to look at Travis Wood. Being a, you know, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm surprised, and I know. Thanks, John. Considering considering the year he had last year, I mean, I look at, I look at the basic stats. I look at a seven to nine record with a five point one two ERA, hundred and twenty five hits and one hundred and sixteen innings pitched, and gone. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, well, I mean, happened? He struggled, but uh, I, you know, I think when you talk about these uh, major league pitchers. You're talking uh, last year. I think I saw a, c- a comment about him in the paper recently, where he, he had better command of his pitchers last year. He uh, so that helped him. He doesn't have that this year. That's something that he and uh, you know Basio and the organization are going to have to look at. But I, you know, I wouldn't throw out the. I wouldn't uh, wouldn't get rid of him. Uh, or no, think no. That, I, still know, think, I still think. I still think he's going to be. It's been a disappointment. You think they're going to move Edwin Jackson? I don't. Well, you, you know, Ed, I, I, I think I, I mentioned this before. Edwin Jackson. Now that is a disappointment. He's a guy I try not to think about because when I, when the Sox got Edwin Jackson a few years ago, and I think they were making a run at the playoffs, and I didn't have a very high opinion of Edwin Jackson, but I got a chance to see him, and you know he had been with teams like uh, I don't know if he was with St. Louis. He was with St. Louis he, after he left the he, Sox. He, yeah. But I think he had been with Detroit, and the th- I, he, he's been around. And I, I, thought, I thought, this guy, you know, why are they getting this guy? Then I saw him pitch for them, and I said, you know, this guy really, I, I don't like the word warrior when it's, a, 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 you know, related to uh, sports. I think it's an overused term. But this guy did have a warrior mentality. He went out, he battled, he pitched hard. He didn't, he, he's never had great control. Uh, you, you, a team that has the luxury to have a guy like Edwin Jackson uh, is, is a good fit for Edwin Jackson. Say a fourth starter on a team like St. I, Louis or Detroit or the Sox. Uh, I, I, think, I, I but think not a guy to pay big bucks no, to be no. sort of in the front of your rotation. No, and I think the, the hope when he was signed was he would, be an, he would be a pitcher that would eat up a lot of innings. Uh, that was the hope. And, and he's uh, got the ability to do that, but he hasn't really done and, it. And he really hasn't done it. Well, the the problem with a guy like Ed, uh, Jackson 
is the same problem I see where, you know, Alfonso Soriano and Carlos Boozer are two guys who were in town who got a lot of flack for things that they should not have been faulted for. If the team decides, to, if they come to Edwin Jackson and say, we're going to pay you 50-some million over four years, and they know that he's really, I, I don't see, as much as I liked him, I wouldn't have ever paid him that. Uh, that's not his fault. He, he gets the blame for it uh, every day that he pitches he and gets, doesn't do he well. He gets the blame but because that's he not his produce. fault. That's the team's fault. And uh, well, it, you know, wait that, a minute, it, it's the team's fault for it's the team's fault for overpaying him for overpaying him. Okay, yeah. it's right. the team's fault for overpaying him, and that's the that's the problem. Uh, I, that's a bad decision on the Cubs' part. I, it's the same as I, I know that you mentioned to me the other day in the library that Chet Kopic uh, and his continuing, as you say, his continuing continuing role to remain relevant criticized Ricketts, and I have no problem with criticizing criticizing Ricketts. I've done it myself. But he criticized Ricketts, I guess, over this over the Cubs trading Samarja. Ricketts not wanting to open his pocketbook to pay Samarja. And I, I have to tell you, we said this yesterday. I'll say this on, on the air. First off, it's a tough call. I don't care if it's Ricketts or whatever owner. But Jeff Samarja and his, uh, whether you like him or not, and his time with the Cubs has not shown enough consistency to merit the type of contract that he was asking for. No. And, you know, the Cubs, and I'm sure that if you go to other cities, people who are fans of other teams will say, we've gotten burned the same way. But if you, it, we have been burned in this city too many times by guys who had one great year or one great half a year, and then the team said, okay, we're going to keep them, we're going to pay them. And the guy went right back in the in the dumper uh, the next year. So sure. I, you know what? There's no way if I'm Tom Ricketts or whoever that I'm paying Jeff Samarja eighty some million dollars, eighty five million over five years, over five years, because he has not shown the consistency. And, and you're trying to and you're trying to base that on a contract that was given, and a lot of people think it was overpaid. Uh, Homer Bailey in uh, Cincinnati, mm-hmm. who. Uh, he had a decent year last year, but I didn't think he was worth the type of contract that they were giving him. And his year this year has been not exactly spectacular. Well, base Jim, based Bailey, on the Bailey, way. In fact, Bailey's going tonight against Milwaukee, and he's 8-5, and five, but I know his ERA is rather high. Based on the way that uh, managers use pitchers these days, can you think of a pitcher in the major leagues that, could command a salary like uh, what you just named, eighty-five million over five years. Is there one? Is there anybody that is outstanding enough in your mind that would command those dollars? Mm. Is there anybody Sandy Koufax like Verlander, uh, Spahn like uh, Verlander? Maybe. Uh, I don't know if Wainwright can get to that level. Hmm. Uh, I'll think of other. Oh, um, um, Kershaw. Yeah, but you have to think about it. I have I'm to saying think somebody who comes right. You know what? If I would have said in years past, you know, who could command that? You'd come up with Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson, Whitey Ford, and, you know, other other names, Juan Marichal, John, Warren Spahn. John, John's giving me the ev- evil eye, so it's time for a station break. We'll be right back. You are listening to Armchair Experts on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network from the John DeVita Broadcast Center. And now back to Armchair Experts and Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. All right, station's been broken. John put it back together. Continue on. And the, we were talking about the, who the, could command a big salary when you think about it and the fact that we... Had to think about it. Yeah, that's, names did uh, that's not the just problem. readily come to um, uh, come to mind. Interesting, though, Jim, that the first name you came up with for Lander is one of the few guys in the majors who has the ability or is allowed to. I won't say the ability, but is allowed to pitch uh, often a complete game. That's the first guy you thought of. 
Yeah. And I yeah, one of the problems is with 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 uh, you know you start to talk about 85 mil over 5 years and this is not the pitcher's problem. This is the this is management's problem. Uh, I, I think Jeff Samarja has had games where he's gone 120 pitches or better and he w- didn't want to come out of the games uh, a lot of times. He's he's got that very competitive mentality which I uh you know, I uh, honor him for, but you have the pitching coaches and the managers and the GM saying, "Well, these guys are six inning, seven inning pitchers tops," so that's the so they're not compiling the records that they did in the past, and they, so that's why the names don't jump out at you. But when you have a guy who's only a six or seven inning pitcher, in my mind, see, this is where the, the players fall into a trap. It's a double-edged sword. The management does not want to uh, to to pitch you more than six or seven innings, but then they, uh, you know, I, they have the the argument that hey, you're only a six or seven inning pitcher, so how can we justify paying you the big money? So management, uh, the the players have fallen into a little bit of a trap there, in, in my estimation, in terms of what they can make by, you know, not fighting a good fight and saying, hey, I want to be more than a six or seven. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, too, and I, Doc, on it, now I'm upset. I forgot to go back and find a podcast interview, and it's probably gone from the, uh, the SCORE website. They had an interview a couple of weeks ago with Leo Mazzoni. Used to be the, you were telling me, and you didn't really give me any details. And, and it was, you know, and I started to listen to it and i got to where i where i was going and i couldn't sit out there and listen to the rest of it but the uh the basic comment was do you think managers are mishandling their pitching staffs now in this day of well you can only go six innings and then we got to have our seventh inning guy and we got to have a seventh inning right-handed guy and our seventh inning left-handed guy and then mm-hmm. we got to have our setup guy and then the we got to have our, our our closer and he said he was very adamant about the fact that he thought managers were mishandling their pitching staffs today. Well, I agree. When you st- when you start to, uh, and I think I've talked about this a little bit, and I, I, I know early in the year I did mention this, uh, Felipe Paulino was, on, was, was in the Sox starting rotation, and they had a couple of rough outings in a row, and Ventura got upset about it and mention it in the papers and my comment to, to you at the time whether it was here on the air or just over coffee or whatever was okay you don't have to like what that polino got bombed two games in a row i could understand that but uh, ventura's aggravation was that one of the times that polino had a bad outing was either preceded or followed up by a bad out- outing from another starting pitcher so he his thing was well now you know i'm wearing my bullpen out and my comment was, no, you're wearing your bullpen out. Not it's not Polino having a bad it's uh, outing. It's not him. Where it's not him doing it. Right. It's you the way you're handling your pitching staff. Mm-hmm. See, I I wonder if these guys could manage. Uh, I think when we were kids, Jim, the, you probably had a ten man pitching staff. And oh yeah. Prior to us, uh, if I'm if I'm reading maybe, this right, maybe in some cases a nine man pitching yes, staff. Yes, uh, you know you what? have your four starters and five guys in the bullpen. Yeah, and those five guys were were basically starters who were either had injury problems at some point or were having some other problems that they were trying to work out. So, but you know you know it's interesting. Uh, even back in the now, and this isn't that far back, thirty years or so, but back in the eighties. Uh, when Sparky Lyle was with the Yankees, and I'm trying to think who the manager would have been then. Uh, not sure. Probably. Could have been Billy Martin. Well, I was going to say, been, it probably uh, was Martin. Could have been Bob Lemon. It or could have been uh, Gene Michael. It would have been uh, any one of yeah. a number of guys. But uh, Sparky Lyle, who was thought of as a closer, now I'm not saying often, but and this would have been Billy Martin, cause now the, I'm, and I'm not able to think of who they were playing, but Sparky Lyle actually was put in and went, better than six innings okay to f- to close out a game uh martin put him in and just kept him in and put him in early i don't know if it was a pinch hitting situation where he went to the bench early but you're talking about a guy who would have been thought of as your closer who did a six inning stint today 
they wouldn't even think about that. They, it's, it's almost as if the guy who's the closer could do no more than one inning. And if you did do, did him more than one inning, he shot for how long? Right. And that that's ridiculous on the face of it, Jim. Right. When you when you just look at the number of appearances a pitcher has made in relationship to his innings. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just glancing down here at the uh, the stat box in today's Sun Times. If you got Neil Ramirez for the Cubs, who's appeared in 32 ball games, he's pitched 27 innings. Okay. You know. You've got Wesley Wright, who 34 games, 26 and two-thirds innings. James Russell, 39 games, 28 and, two th 28 and a third innings. So this is not like the, you're, you know, you're being, I, I don't know. The closer so in other words, what I'm getting out of this to try to prove my point is that if you reduce the size of the staff and you'd say those three guys were on your staff, right. Now they'd pitch more innings, but they're they're not pitching a lot of innings to begin with. So you no. could probably double or triple those innings easily. Very, very easily. I mean, I look at Rondon. 35 game. Well, he's the closest one. Obviously, he's the closer. He's going to come in and finish your ninth inning. 35 games, 34 and, 34 and a third innings pitched. So it's not like uh, it's it's not like, yeah. You know, the, the, whole, the whole idea to of a, a specialty guy, and I'm, normally it's lefty versus lefty, uh, not so much righty versus righty, but to have your left-handed specialist come in and face one batter or two batters, you know, you know I could see where if you had a guy, say uh, say you are a side-arming lefty or you had a, a trick pitch. I, the guy that always sticks in my mind was a guy, he played with the Sox, he played with the Yankees, he may, he may even still be in the league. Uh, he was the one guy, sticks in my mind, because he had sort of a funky delivery, and I think he had an unusual pitch, I don't know what it was, was Boone Logan. He, to me, when I saw him pitch, I'd say, yeah, this guy makes sense to put him against the lefty, because you could see he'd be very difficult for a lefty. But a guy who's just got a straight delivery, a normal variety of pitches, what is the big advantage? I mean, uh, it's being overdone. Okay, there are certain guys who I'd say, yeah, okay, I see the advantage, but others not so much. And uh, I know that recently, uh, now this is the reverse when Seattle was in town or, or the Sox were out to play Seattle. Uh, who was their manager? Lloyd McClendon actually started le uh, seven lefties against the left-handed starter. I saw that. And he basically said, well, you know, I don't have anybody right-handed who's hitting that well, so what's the big difference? And I think the starter in question was Chris Sale, who's one of your better pitchers in the game today. And uh, so he put seven lefties out there to face a lefty initially. So what is the big advantage is you're getting out of a, you know, based on that, you're putting seven lefties against one of the best pitchers right now in the game so how much of an advantage did Lloyd McClendon think that was for the Sox probably not much mm -hmm. yeah who do you think's most responsible for the way pitching staffs are handled nowadays who's caused this uh, I think it's a combination some people say the agents I think that's a good argument they want to get the most uh, bang for their buck obviously they're making their money off of the people they represent I don't think it's the pitchers at all. Uh, honest to God, I think there's some of them who have been babied into thinking that they can't go more than that. But I think, really, knowing athletes, I think the mindset would be, I started it, I want to finish it. Uh, and I think I'd say 99% probably have the mindset that they'd like to do that, but that's not what's happening. So they go along with it because they're good soldiers. And uh, I think... Uh, I think management uh, is at fault as well because they spend a lot of money on these guys and they think that they're protecting their interests by, uh, quote, unquote, not overusing them. Since you have, uh, since it's uh, this weekend is the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremonies, you have three of the winningest managers in the expansion era mm -hmm. going into the Hall of Fame this weekend. Bobby Cox, Tony La Russa, Joe Torre. Okay. I would make the statement that I think Tony La Russa is most responsible for the way pitching staffs are being handled nowadays. 
Yeah, he might have been a, a pioneer of that, I don't I guess. Pioneer good, pioneer bad, but I think that's probably one of the... Well, you you know, you're bringing up, uh, when we were texting last night, uh, you're, you're touching on something that uh, texting-wise we couldn't get into, but I, it's an interesting thing to think about because Tony La Russa, the way he did it, and being a Hall of Fame manager, I would say he was sort of masterful at the way he handled his pitching staff. Oh, I think but, he he discovered what he he took uh, what he had now, and and exploited it. Well, uh, yeah, that's why I think he's a Hall of Fame manager because there was times when he didn't always. Now there was a guy who you could say uh, was uh, I don't like to use the term genius, so I won't use that. But was a very <laughs> very no because the there there are no I always re- I always refer to him as the great Tony Larusa, all one word. <laughs> but but Tony Larusa was very good at getting the most out of the uh, the the. Uh, abilities the, the the varying abilities that he had on his team and in this case we're talking about pitching but one of the things that I had texted you last night and I'm not going to get into football at all but Bill J- Belichick was a guy that I came uh that came to my mind there was a guy who prepares and prepares and prepares and tries to cover all the bases and it works for him but there are other coaches who do the same thing and it does not work for them. I would say Tony Larusa is a guy in baseball that's similar. He uses pitching staff a certain way, and it worked for him. Now a lot of people, uh, at least in your view, Jim, are copying what he did, and it doesn't work for and everybody. And it, it, it doesn't work for everyone. People are trying to take the formula and not necessarily have the pieces. Mm-hmm. He discovered He discovered that, boy, I got this guy... Eckersley in the bullpen, right? Or on my pitching staff can't start worth a mm-hmm. rat's hoo ha anymore. But boy, I can throw him in for an inning. Yeah, yeah. Pitch him to a World Series. But actually, when you think about it, Larusa, as uh, you know, even though you're saying he sort of changed the way things are, I think actually what he did is what a lot of great managers prior to him did. They they looked at the the pieces that they had and they used them properly. I, I know I just mentioned Billy Martin, the way he used Sparky Lyle. I know going back to, uh, say, Casey Stengel, who was probably a mediocre or less manager when he didn't have the talent. Obviously, any manager would be. But when he had the talent, he knew what to do with it. And he, he took a guy like Joe Page, who was his, okay, uh, they didn't use the term at the time, but was his closer. But you would you could you would see Joe Page he might uh, do anything from an inning to six or seven innings depending on the situation. So I, I go back to what I I don't know if I ever verbalized this to make it a, a clear word picture in everybody's head. But the guys who are successful are the guys who know what they're looking at. So you have to know, like in the case of Tony Larusa or Bill Belichick or Casey Stengel, what you're looking at. And how uh, I'm one of our old friends, Ron Kalina, a great basket high school basketball coach, used to tell me, Rich, you have to put your players in a position for them to succeed. Right. And if that meant that I had a great point guard who should never shoot the ball, or maybe shoot the ball once or twice a game at the most, but that guy would be at his best just handling the ball and distributing the ball and not shooting a hell of a lot. Excuse my language. But, John, John, uh, John crossed himself. John, He's, but he'll be fine. He'll that's be fine. the way you use them, and that was the best contribution he could make for himself and the team. This is the, the, the secret of all great coaches. I might have a guy who was the guy that the Patriots had who was a linebacker, Vrabel, that they'd put in a tight end. And the guy caught like seven or nine passes in his life, and I think almost every one of them was a touchdown. Yeah. So Belichick saw this ability this guy had and used it uh i don't know nine seven or nine times in a career isn't a lot but used it at the opportune time and you know got the most out of another ability that this guy had there's guys who recognize the talent right and then there are guys who try to force the talent into what they're doing right and it it just doesn't work they come with their formula how about guys? and and I think that I think one example that I can think of was um, when Mike Martz was uh, was with the Bears as the uh, as the OC. That's a great great point. He forced 
he forced his system into the talent, and yes. it didn't work. It didn't work. All right. Uh, you're right. That's a great example. Yeah. How about guys like, uh, you take your hats off to high school coaches, uh, like the guys who coached uh, Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. Magic Johnson being a guy who, when he was in high school, I think was at his full height of about 6'8". Michael Jordan was about 6'4". When he got to the, the diversity level, most high school coaches would see a guy that size and say, you're a center, you're a forward, you're going to play underneath. Those guys' coaches were, you know what, they wanted to win, obviously, but they also were thinking en enough about the big picture in terms of the guys that they had to see down the road to benefit these guys and played them as guards, and which was their position as it went, uh, when they went to college and the pros. And you know what? Uh, to me, uh, big-time props to those guys because uh, I've always told my kids, if you coach, I call it body, uh, sort of body, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you sort of pigeonhole people by their body uh, structure. You know what? You could have a guy who's, Six four and two hundred and forty pounds that could throw the heck out of the ball. You know, maybe instead of that guy being a linebacker or a tight end, maybe that guy's a quarterback, or maybe you have a guy who's built like Charles Barkley, who you're thinking, oh my, this guy's not a basketball player at all. Look at the body on him. But here's a guy who was six four and what two hundred and sixty, two hundred seventy pounds who could leap was agile, was like a gazelle uh, on the court despite his, his girth. Mm -hmm. So hats off to those coaches who can see those things about those players. That's why a Tony La Russa or a Casey Stengel or a Bill Belichick who will be in the Hall of Fame, that's why they're Hall of Famers. They identify what the strengths of their players are, and they play to those strengths. Hmm. Here's something totally unrelated, but I just saw an interesting tweet here. Uh, nothing sports-wise, but the U.S. Appeals Court throws out IRS regulations that implements key Obamacare health insurance subsidies. So that's going to screw up every. That's going to screw up the tax law next year. Hey, Jim, you'll be making money hand over fist. No, there, buddy. if that screws up, if that means I got to pay more for my health insurance, I'm not going to be a happy guy. Uh, well, it'll make up for it in all the uh, all of the uh, the uh, the tax. Uh, forms that you're going to be doing. Yeah. So where, how, how much time do we have left, John? Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Jim, Jeez. We, 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 we got off on a... I am enjoying this conversation. We got right off here. on a baseball tangent That's all right. after, uh, after this. It's baseball season. Um, what do we want to... What do you want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? I don't... I'm not well, in, I'm not in your, a Bears... I'm not in a Bears mood yet. Oh, you're although, not in a Bears although, mood? Although training camp, training camp started... Oh, did what yesterday? Or it's or no, it starts uh, Friday. Friday. It starts Friday. It starts Friday. Here's Rick Morrissey saying ten and six. Boy, I I tell you, I when you you talk, especially a, a game like football, or any of these games with so many injuries today, how anybody could make? I I know that's his job, but I don't know how you can make a prediction. I I think the whole thing is I'd have to see. I think the key guy, because I saw it on the, the front of the, uh, the the paper there, and I think they're right on the money. If Jared Allen, I'm not even saying that he's got to come up with some gaudy sack statistics, but if his motor runs as high as it always has, and he can um, help the other players on the defensive line to put a lot of pressure on the QBs, then I think 10-6 and six might be uh, very doable. Might even be a little bit better, but I think he's the key guy. I think really, I, 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 Jared Allen will be uh, the key man on the Bears this year. If he goes oh. well, I think everything will go well. I I think what they did on the defense this year when they signed uh, Lamar Houston, when they signed uh, Jared Allen. How how about this other guy they signed from? Was he from Detroit? Willie Young. Will yeah. So the, I think they're going to be solid defensive. Uh, they could be solid. Uh, that's it's. They there's going to be, be a lot of ifs there. You, you realize, you know, an eight and eight record last year with the defense that was thirtieth in the league, thirtieth mm -hmm. out of thirty-two. You just get up to average. Yeah, 
you get up to about 14th, 15th, 16th. Well, you you're talking. The, you're talking very easily a ten and six record. But so, who's the powers? Who's the powers in the NFC this year? Who knows? It, Seattle. I, well, I mean, you got to look right away, and you got to think Seattle. You you would assume, but I don't. San would, Francisco. Know. Yeah, I. Well, yeah, I guess. Who I guess. Else? I, I. You know, Jim. Uh, can the, can the Bears? Football is a crapshoot, though. Can you? Can you? Can the Bears? Are, are the Packers going to be better this year? I have no idea. You know, there. I'd say this though. The I think you either mentioned this at the library or maybe Jimmy Sunshine or somebody. Uh, we have a cast, know, John. We have a cast of characters. We got Sports Jimmy. We got Jimmy Sunshine. Somebody had said, "Well, look at the receiving core we have." But I, I you know, one of the big uh, things in sports. And now Brandon Marshall has been around what as long as Jay Cutler. So that's quite a you know that's not a, a, like fifteen years, but that's probably getting closer to ten years now, right? I mean, you, you, between seven and ten years that they've yeah. been around yeah. in the game in pro yeah. football. One is a guy say like Marshall hit his peak and then start to go down. I mean, I'm not saying that he's at that point. I don't know that, but to just say, well, we have one of the outstanding receiving cores in the league. I think you're saying, again, uh, it's a crapshoot. Elshon Jeffrey looks like he's got a really high upside, but he's still he's still got to go out there and do it. I guess that's the bottom line. They they have to reproduce at least what they did last year, and there's no guarantee of that. There's too many variables in football to really come out and say, well, this team is going to be 10-6 and six if the defense – is good. Well, how do you know that the offense isn't going to have uh, regress some way? Not because of uh, anything. I think the coach is going to do the best he can with what he's got. But let's say you have injuries with receivers or the offensive line, say Long and uh, who's the other ta- who's the young tackle? Uh, what's his name? Uh, can't think of it. But I, I yeah. say they don't progress the way you think they should. Say Slauson doesn't play as well as he did last year or say Garza is running on fumes and he's not as good. Well, I think you're you're looking at the end of Garza. Uh I I think he, he my, signed one year and he's he's up there. So they're going to have to start looking for My a, point though, Jim, successor. is to say you can't just say we're going to be as good offensively this year as we the we were last year. There's just too much too many things that could could go wrong. And I'm not saying they're going to go wrong, but it's pro football. Things do go wrong. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I'd like to see us go ten and six. I think we could do. I think we could do better, maybe. But you can also go. Got to, everything's got to. Uh, everything's got to. Everything's got to fall, fall into place. Everything. All the pieces are in place. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it's very possible they could go ten and six this year and miss the playoffs. That's possible too. You know. I don't. I don't know how how good Packers the have is. to. Packers figure to be better. And as Morrissey said, so do the Detroit Lions, but they always figure to be better and rarely are. Well, Andy, yeah. who has coffee with us in the morning, yeah. is a big 49ers fan. Right. So he's always throwing the 49ers in our face. And he's, well, Kaepernick, is, you know, Cutler is nowhere close to Kaepernick, which is I don't want to get into that discussion because I would say as a basic quarterback, Jay Cutler is as good or even better than a Kaepernick. But when it, say you're taking a team like San Francisco, you figure them to be up there. But the big wild card on their team, is a guy like Kaepernick because he's so athletic and he runs so much. You know what? That's that's an accident waiting to happen, okay? Because eventually a quarterback, when you're going to run as much as Kaepernick and he's got the ability to do it, you're going to get hurt. So, you know what? There goes your season because who the heck is after Kaepernick? So I'm saying, yeah, is San Francisco likely to be one of the best teams in the NFC? Definitely. But if Kaepernick keeps running around like he does, you know what? That could go up in smoke uh, whenever. You don't know what's going to happen. All right. All right. Well, let's see. We've got about three minutes left. We haven't even touched on the Bulls yet. I, I, I thought one of the things we actually did talk about yesterday is we, we might talk a lot of basketball. I thought we would, too, especially after I go through the list here. I went to NBA.com and pulled down the free agents that are still available. I, interesting, interesting names here. Yeah, 
What are they? Well, how about Lou An who Lou Anmanson? Amundsen. Uh, the, the Bulls, Bulls just cut him. The Bulls cut him. I don't even really know who he is. And uh, I don't Lou, really... we hardly knew ye. Yeah. Interesting names that are still on there, and I look at the age of some of them, and I think, oh my God, they've been around that long. Yeah, sometimes wow, those years go suddenly, by quick. Suddenly, you know, Shane Battier, well, Shane retired. Now he's retiring, yeah. But 13 years, he's 35. Chauncey Billups is still out there. He's 37, but the Pistons did not renew his contract. Elton Brand is 35. It seems yeah. like only yesterday he was drafted. When you say names like Battier and Billups and Brand, those are three great examples, Jim. And I, I know that I was watching the finals, and they said Shane, this is Shane Battier's last game. He's retired. I'm thinking, man, Shane Battier, I thought he just came in the league. Yeah. Like. So, yeah, and yeah, I mean. You're making a great point. You know, you look at, you, you know, you look at some other names uh, uh, on the list that are out there, like Al Harrington. He's 34, but he's been around for 16 years. Wow. Well, he must have, was he a uh, guy right out of high school? High school. Here's another one. Jermaine O'Neal. 35. See, now Jermaine O'Neal. 18 uh, years. He's been, ha yeah, I was going to say, he's been hanging around. And I, I, I think that he's one of those guys like uh, maybe Shaq was at the end of his career where a team always picks him up because, they need to you know, they up. need uh, maybe five or six minutes from a guy. I'm sure yeah. he's not playing a lot of minutes these no. days. Mm-mm, mm-mm. You know, if the if the Bulls are looking for maybe another center, well, obviously uh, Nazi. Muhammad is uh, still out there mm -hmm. uh, as a free agent. Here's another name that seems like only yesterday he just came around. Kenyon Martin, ah, 36, Kenyon. Year, 36 yeah. years old, 14 wow. years. I look at this and I go, oh my gosh, where is the time gone? Now, I think maybe other than a guy like Chauncey Billups, who for a guard at 37, that's pretty old, I think all of these guys that you're naming are going to be signed by somebody. Cause, somebody uh, will pick uh, them up. Somebody will pick them up. Now the the name that's still most interesting, and uh, I haven't it, it they, I know he's being considered, but they haven't done anything. It's obviously still uh, Aaron Brooks. So they they haven't done anything. With no. Him. Okay. No. Now who was he with last? Do you know? Was he with Denver? Did you say? Denver I think you texted me that he was with. Denver. I I know at one point in time he was with Houston. Now I can't remember if he was with Houston last year or not, and okay. I I forgot to print that off uh, a couple of the things that were interesting too that kind of kind of made me wonder especially with the signings of uh, Gasol and uh, uh, Miritich since uh, Gasol never really has had the reputation as a defender uh, Mike Dunleavy has never never really had the reputation as a defender but obviously these players come in and fit have found a way and adopted to the um, uh, Thibodeau formula because one of the things I started to look at was the another analytic, and I don't even know how it's calculated, but it's an estimate of what a player contributed to defense. Uh, Jim, I have to go say that, and I, th I said this to you about Gasol, but I, I like to know who says these things about these guys not being known as defenders. Mike Dunleavy, if I'm not mistaken, played at Duke. And, uh, yeah, and that's what's You don't play me. for Mike Krzyzewski you don't like, you without don't being a defensive yeah. guy. Uh, Paul Gasol played for Phil Jackson. You do not play for Phil Jackson unless you play defense. So I like to know who's saying these things. I mean, where do these reps just, come from? Because uh, I think they're you know, totally off the wall. You know, and I, and I, uh, I looked at it. I never, I never viewed. Uh, I, I kind of viewed Gasol as a defender, obviously, because of what he played. Even though the numbers, if you look at the numbers, it didn't really show it. But then again, that was a really bad Laker team. Well, last Jim, year, you, you know what's interesting about, and I fell into this trap when the Bulls uh, signed Nate Robinson that year, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, geez, you know, they're just trying to fill holes any way that they can. But then I I, I saw Nate Robinson played for the Celtics when uh, Thibodeau was an assistant, and then I started to think, well, you know what, Thibodeau is not going to sign off on Nate Robinson coming to the Bulls unless he thinks that Nate Robinson can help the Bulls. So I yeah. started to think about it in a whole different way. And Nate Robinson obviously was a a good uh, man for the Bulls to have. So when you, I, I always try to look not so much at the player or what the papers say, but I look at who who did these guys play for, 
Uh, it's the same thing I would say for Carlos Boozer. You know, they always try to say he was a poor defender. Well, he played college ball for Shashevsky, and he played for how many years for the Bulls with Thibodeau. He could not have been that bad of a defender. I would say he, this, at the end of a game, Todd Gibson was a better defender, but that doesn't mean that Boozer was a terrible defender. There was just a better defender to be used at that point. If you look at this, and I, I have to look into this more, this so-called defensive win shares, in other words, how many victories has this player contributed to? Defensive win shares. I, I'd like uh, to know what that formula is. I don't know. But, I mean, it comes to the point where you have you have Boozer contributing over f- over four wins because of his defense. Okay. And that's like the fourth best on the team. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, obviously, he played defense. Dunleavy was right in there, too. Yeah, For a guy who has a reputation uh, of not being. See, what I think that where these reputations come for, from is you wouldn't think of Dunleavy or Boozer or Gasol as particularly fast guys. No. Okay, right. so when a, a guy, say a sports writer, looks at those guys, yes, they're not moving as fast as uh, Derrick Rose or you know, Kobe Bryant or somebody like that uh, or LeBron James. But that doesn't mean they're in a, a ineffective as defenders. I mean, defense is just, uh, it's, you know, so, uh, how would you say it? It's a stay at it type of thing. It's, right. You know, you know, you could be initially beat on a play, and, let's, and this is a very simplified way of putting it. You could be initially beat on something, but if you stay with it and recover, you may end up making a good defensive play at it. So, I, I you know, I, I think that they look at these guys they don't see him being as quick as other guys, and they automatically think that translates into not being a good defender. I don't think that's the way it works. They also have uh, uh, Miritich has the reputation of being uh, not being a good defender, or is coming into it with not being a good defender because they say he can't jump. Well, that well, uh, I'll I'll give you a great example. Uh, Paul Silas couldn't jump uh, probably six inches off the ground. One of the greatest one defenders of the greatest, you one could One of the greatest defenders name. you ever could name, absolutely. Yeah. So that has nothing so, to do with anything. I think it's going to be an exciting year basketball-wise. First time in a long time I've actually been looking forward to the Bulls. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be, be fun. fun. And we're going over time, and John is patiently waiting John for us to John is quit. patiently waiting. No, John says no, no. He holds up his hand and goes no, no, but he goes go, go, you know, go. John sort of go. looks like the Pope when he holds up his hand like that. <laughs> You know, all you need is one of those big rings on your finger, and you know. I was I was checking to see if you had the red shoes on today. Yeah, up up out comes the cross. Okay. I I was looking to see if he had the red shoes on, but no, no. I think it's time we get out of here, don't you? Yeah, we've we've uh, intruded on John's day long enough, and That's uh, right. we appreciate it. That's right. All right, it's been fun as always. Thanks to John Devita. The birthday boy. We enjoyed it. Hope you did. We'll catch you again soon. Yeah, we need to. And uh, Kev, uh, we we always fail to mention you, but you help make this whole thing go as well. You betcha. All right, we're out of here. You have been listening to Armchair Experts from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. This broadcast was directed by John DeVita, edited by Stephen Lehman, our audio engineer is James Rohde, and the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network is John Chaconda. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Tuesday, July the 22nd, the year 2014. Until next time, be safe and thanks for listening.